part of it is that for ideas, events that are beyond individual ex concrete experience and the world of gossip, we just don't think in terms of objective truth and falsity. This is what I call the mythology mindset as opposed to the reality mindset. People are pretty rational when it comes to their the concrete particulars of their day-to-day -day life. They kind of have to. Is there enough gas in the car to take me where I want to go? Are they, is there enough food in the fridge? Do I have enough money to, to pay the rent? There are people, by and large, don't have wacky beliefs and they can't afford to, and it's easy to stay in touch with reality. But often in the realm of the, the vaccines, the QAnon, the, the, the protocols of the elders of Zion, where historically you just couldn't know what goes on in the corridors of power or at the microscopic scale of disease causation or the cosmic scale of the origin of the universe. And so you could believe whatever you want. And if you believe whatever you want, you go with the beliefs that are most empowering, ennobling, invigorating, that make the, that spread the right moral values, depending of course, on what group you belong to. And there, it's not a question of cognitive load. It's a question, going back to our original conversation of what are your, what are the ultimate goals of the reasoning? If it's to ratify a uh, the, the correct moral view, the, who's the, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, then in seeking that goal, it's all, all too rational. It's not a very good goal as opposed to objective reality. But again, objective reality until recently was a luxury. And in some ways it still is when it comes to these more cosmic, metaphysical, historical, political, scientific realms where our species just isn't used to having the fruits of laboratory science and government record keeping. And so naturally we fall back on, uh, on comforting and inspiring myths. Are these mythology beliefs, memes in the Dawkins sense, like you play a game of telephone and the, the story evolves over time and maybe it becomes more outlandish, but the more outlandish it is, the more likely it is to be shared. So it evolves of its own accord. I think it does have certainly a replication dynamics in that some ideas are more contagious than others. Where I think the meme analogy falls short, especially since in Dawkins' case, quite literally, it was adapted from genes. It, he introduced the term and the concept in his book, The Selfish Gene, on the process of natural selection. The whole beauty and power of the idea of natural selection is that the mutations are random. Random not in the sense that every mutation is equally likely, but in the sense of blind to their outcome. That is, your DNA does not mutate in a way that makes you better off. That's, that would be intelligent design, and intelligent design we know is false. There's no way for a DNA base to know which way to, to mutate in the world that you're living in. And the, what leads to adaptation is the winnowing over generations of of different variants and their success in the environment. Memes aren't like that in the sense that it's not just typographical errors. It's not monkeys at a typewriter. People, intelligent design is true in the case of the evolution of ideas. We're the intelligent creatures. We, of course, are products of natural selection, which is not intelligent, but the product of an unintelligent process in our case actually is intelligent. And so the stories that we craft, the embellishments that we add, the modifications are not typographical errors. They are designed to make them all a bit more catchy, a bit more plausible, a bit more inspiring. And so you can't, I've argued anyway, that you, that's where the meme analogy falls short. You can't skip the psychology, the cognitive psychology, the moral psychology of what is crafting the memes in particular directions or giving them particular structures. That's the same thing that happens with cultural evolution, right? In, indeed. And I, that's why I think cultural evolution, AKA history, I, I even though big fan of uh, evolution and the use of evolution in constraining psychological hypotheses, and I'm a big fan of trying to bridge the two cultures, science on the one hand, humanities on the other, by studying culture with our best scientific tools. 
Cultural evolution as an analog to biological evolution, I think, is very limited, precisely because it's very unlike evolution in the sense that there really is intelligent design. There really are people behind the stories, the myths, the narratives, trying to make them more compelling, not just introducing the occasional typographical error that goes viral. It sounds like if we are the intelligent designers, so to speak, in cultural evolution, it always would be towards the better. But you do have these parasitic ideas, like you might be familiar with Gadsad's use of that term. He seems to make the case that beliefs can hijack people, even if people don't realize that's happening. Yeah, so there is, and that is borrowed from natural selection, where you can have, especially in the case of parasites, commandeering of a nervous system to benefit the parasite as opposed to the organism, like the snail that, under the influence of a parasite that's infiltrated its nervous system, climbs up to the tip of a grass stalk where it's all the more visible to birds, not so good for the snail, but it's very good for the parasite to get into the next snail through the bird droppings. So is there an analogy where ideas can, I, I think that is possible and that's been invoked in say cases of say suicide terrorism, where the, maybe it's the idea that spreads by example to the detriment of the suicide terrorist who spreads the idea by virtue of his gory death that gets picked up by all the papers. I, I think it, it's possible and it may be in the case of conspiracy theories that there is a kind of cultural evolution for the good of the meme as opposed to the good of the person in the sense that uh, conspiratorial beliefs are part of a family of belief that are designed to be unfalsifiable. So the fact that the conspiracy is not obvious, what do you mean? This bureaucrat doesn't look like a, a cannibal. Oh, that's proof of what a diabolical conspiracy it is. That's how well they hide it. And there are other families of beliefs like that, such as especially ones that immunize themselves from criticism. If you doubt that all racial differences are due to racism, that's proof that you're a racist. That kind of means that an awful lot of people are going to attribute all racial differences to racism out of fear of becoming a racist and so the being called a racist anyway. And so it's another example of a self-perpetuating idea. Or yet another one is God, it sure doesn't look like the universe is designed by a benevolent God. God works in mysterious ways and he doesn't want you to know his design. And we humans are too feeble to figure out how God works. So again, it's an idea that might have some persistence and longevity precisely because by its very content, it resists falsification. So I do, I would acknowledge that there, that memetics in the sense of the inherent copying, spreadability, resistance to extinction of ideas can play a role in the spread of those very ideas. The difference is that in addition to that, there is an awful lot of brain power, including the urges to demonize enemies, to appeal to the way other people's minds work. So how did the pedophiles in QAnon become cannibalistic pedophiles? You don't get from pedophile to cannibal by, 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 by flipping a, a letter, by a typo. It's, you can tell there is someone thinking, what is the worst, most heinous, most vile accusation I could make? I'm going to throw that onto the pile and that'll make it all the people on my side who, you know, hate Hillary Clinton, hate the left, hate the Democrats, they'll gobble this up like catnip if I add that detail. So you need to account for an awful lot of, as I put it, design, intelligent toward the narrow goal of attracting adherence, not so intelligent in terms of the greater societal goal of spreading true beliefs. In that case, would it be better if we become better scientists and statisticians and logicians in our lay beliefs and learn to spot these fallacies? Or is it more like those are tools only for problems of objectivity and it would be better to just identify mythology mindsets when we see them and then leave them alone, as opposed to here's why the pedophile ring couldn't have been set up in this location because someone had an alibi or whatever. You probably don't want to get rid of that belief with logic. You probably just want to identify it as a conspiracy belief and move on with your life. 
It's a good question. How do you, what is the, just practically the most effective way to debunk outlandish beliefs? And going back to the idea of these pernicious ideas as parasites, there, there's an idea, the philosopher Handy Norman has publicized this, that we need a kind of vaccine or cognitive equivalent of immunology, training people, maybe even kids in school to recognize the hallmarks of nutball conspiracy theories and to have them even distinguish between plausible and crazy beliefs as a kind of exercise to kind of strengthen the cognitive immune system. So that is one way, sharing the ways in which, to the extent that we feel we do have objective beliefs, how do we, what in, in, entitles us to say that? And it's things like empirical testability, free speech, freedom of inquiry, openness to criticism, fact-checking, communities of peer reviewers, all of that kind of gadgetry of truth, or of at least seeking the truth, because we never know when we have it. If people knew that the extent that we can get true beliefs, like putting someone on the moon or inventing smartphones, it's thanks to those social arrangements. That may be a kind of, of mental immunity. People thinking just because I read it on Twitter, that shouldn't be enough to make me believe that it's true. But on top, and a more widespread applicability of the canons of reason to all questions in life. And this is the watchword of the rationality community. The people who try to encourage, even fetishize rationality in, in, in personal and social and political and educational contexts, more, more Bayesian reasoning, more statistical decision theory, more avoidance of logical and uh, critical fallacies. But on, and I'm in favor of all those things, but another crucial ingredient that I think has been neglected is we do, you and including you and me and everyone we know, we accept a lot of scientific findings just because we trust the scientists, partly because you and I are, there are people. And so we know how they work and we know that if they came up with some bad idea, chances are someone else would expose it and criticize them for it. But by and large, we just trust that the, the climate scientists got the climate science right and the immunologists got the vaccines right. Because none of us can really, honestly, or most of us anyway, certainly me, don't grasp the science deeply enough that we could actually reconstruct it. We just say, they, they publish in peer-reviewed journals, they can't be too crazy. If you don't have that, if you don't say there are people and we trust them, then if you just think they're just another faction, they're just another interest group, they're just another priesthood, then you can blow them off and accept some Hollywood airhead or Twitter influencer as being just as plausible. And so a lot of it is getting people to vest their trust in the truly trustworthy institutions. That means doing things that we have been pretty bad at doing, depoliticizing our scientific and journalistic institutions. I think a catastrophic failure is when our networks, our newspapers, our scientific agencies, our universities just brand themselves as mouthpieces of the political left. Even if you yourself are with the political left, if that's just all of the branding, the coloring, the messaging, then people in the center and right are just going to blow you off. And we don't want that. We want people to get vaccinated, which means trusting the immunologists and the public health officials, which means that they've got to earn that trust by proving their case and not being seen as just cheerleaders for a particular ideology. You mentioned really early on in the book that anyone who tries to argue out of rationality is trying to use rationality to argue against, thereby disproving their whole point. Yes, it's a, an argument that I adapted from the philosopher Thomas Nagel, although he's probably not the first one to make it, but it's the, it's the ultimate reason why relativism, postmodernism, subjectivity, mysticism, irrationality can't, can't be right, must be rejected. And the reason is that as soon as you make an argument for why any of them is compelling, why we ought to believe them, then you are appealing to reason and rationality and truth and objectivity. If someone says every, everything is subjective, you can say, is that statement subjective? If it is, you can believe it, but I don't have to. If everything is social construction, what about the claim that everything is a social construction? If that's a social construction and I'm not part of that 
social community, then I can blow it off. If you want to convince me, then you've got to frame it in terms that we both accept, namely the canons of reason and rationality and objectivity. So it's a peculiar kind of argument, say what philosophers call a transcendental argument, that it kind of appeals to the very conditions that make the discussion possible in the first place, which are never stated and in a sense can't be stated because you couldn't even state them or interpret them unless you already subscribed to the notion that we should, we ought to be rational. Nonetheless, it is, uh, I think, inescapable.